Hi, and welcome to the next lecture in fluid mechanics. Last time, we learned about how we will be studying fluids in this course. There were two main concepts that we will repeatedly see moving forward. First, we zoom in on observation windows, and these windows aren't so big that we miss important changes in the flow, but they're not so small that we break continuity. Then, we fix our observation window in space and watch fluid pass by using an Eulerian perspective. So we are constantly considering a point in space and how fluid changes as it passes through that point. Today, we're going to dive into the conservation equations of fluid mechanics, starting with the conservation of mass. Let's get started. The conservation laws of fluid mechanics govern entirely how a fluid moves in response to external forcing. During fluid motion, it needs to follow certain rules of physics. Three main properties of a fluid must be conserved, no matter what. These properties are the fluid mass, because mass cannot be created or destroyed, momentum, following Newton's famous laws of motion and F equals ma, and energy which, like mass, also cannot be created or destroyed. Typically, in introductory fluid mechanics, the conservation of mass and momentum take the lead, and conservation of energy is reserved for more complex situations. This is the approach we'll take, where we will see the conservation of energy eventually, but the focus will be on the conservation of mass and momentum for now. Before we start building these equations from scratch, it's first helpful to see them together in their final form so we know what we should end up with. Conservation of mass and momentum for an incompressible fluid, where incompressibility is a common assumption that we'll talk about later in this video, look like this. Conservation of mass for an incompressible fluid is a sum of three spatial derivatives of a velocity field and set equal to zero. This essentially means that in our observation window, mass is constant. Here, x, y, and z define a point in space, and u, v, and w correspond to their three components of velocity. This first equation is simple enough, but unfortunately, it gets a bit worse. This long beast of an equation that's next is the conservation of momentum for an incompressible fluid, which is famously referred to as the Navier-Stokes equations. Here, only one of the three equations is shown. There is a separate equation for each direction of velocity, which we'll go over later. All this long equation means is that the momentum is constant, the fluid version of F equals ma. Here, the fluid density is rho, T is time, P is pressure, mu is the fluid dynamic viscosity, and G is gravity. All these terms represent some ways the fluid can respond to forcing. Now that we know what we want to end up with, first we need to figure out how to get here. And today, we start with the conservation of mass, which will be the focus for the rest of the video. In solids, if you have one big solid and divided it up, you would have a bunch of pieces that have the same mass as the original piece. Solids are a bit easier to track and deal with, specifically when it comes to mass. In fluids, it gets more complicated. Consider flow through a duct where it starts at a big opening and converges to a smaller opening between points 1 and 2. This is called a converging duct. The fluid at these points has a density and a velocity, rho and u. Instead of working with mass itself, because we have a flowing fluid, it is easier to work with the mass flow rate, or m dot. The mass flow rate for a fluid is m dot equals rho ua, where a is the area that the fluid passes through. What we know is that mass is conserved, which means that m dot is the same everywhere. This means that at point 1, the product of rho, u, and a is the same as at a point 2. So let's keep this mass flow rate conservation in our minds as we start to think about looking through a specific observation window. Consider a one-dimensional flow, meaning flow is only in one direction, passing through our observation window, which is represented as a cube in space. We draw our cube in the XYZ coordinate system 
and in this case it is 1D, so flow is restricted to move only in the X direction. The green walls represent capping our cube in the other direction, so flow can't get in or out. As a result, we have flow entering our cube and exiting our cube in the X direction. Now, let's label the dimensions of the cube. This cube has sides with the length delta x, delta y, and delta z, and our velocity in is u1 and out is u2. The volume of our cube, by definition, is delta x times delta y times delta z. Conservation of mass states that if the mass going into the cube and out leaving the cube are different, then the cube must be changing mass itself. In other words, if we put more stuff into a box than we take out, our box gains stuff and gets heavier. We can write this more officially as a balance of mass flow rates into and out of the cube. Here, the left hand side represents the flow through our surfaces, and the right hand side is the rate of change of the cube mass. The flow rate through a surface, as we talked about above, is rho ua, where a is the area. And the time of rate of change of the mass of the cube is delta m over delta t. Let's use the fact that the mass of the cube is the density of the fluid inside the cube times the volume of that cube, so rho times v. Take these relationships and plug them back into the above equation and we get the following. Let's transform our area and volume variables using basic geometry. The cube has a volume delta x, delta y, delta z. The area of any given surface is a product of two sides. In this case, we care about the surfaces with area delta y times delta z because these are the surfaces that the flow goes through in our 1D setup. Plug our geometry back into the equation and we get another equation. Remember, capital delta here is a symbol that effectively means change in. So anytime delta is next to a quantity, we really care about the change in that quantity and not necessarily the quantity itself. Let's recognize that rho 2 u2 minus rho 1 u1 is really another way to say change in rho times u, or delta rho u. We end up with this simple relationship that represents the conservation of mass for fluid through a cube restricted to a single dimension. But what if we have more than one dimension? Well, we can build upon this simple case by adding flow in the y and z directions, making it fully three-dimensional. We draw our cube again, but this time instead of capping two directions with green walls, we're going to add other flows through v and w velocities. For the left-hand side, let's consider the mass flow rate for each direction individually. We already know the x direction because we solved for that above. The y and z directions look similar, just with a different velocity direction multiplying the density, and with a different area representing the other sides of the cubes. In y, it's rho times v because we care about the y velocity, and the area that flow goes through is delta x delta z. In z, it's rho times w, because we care about the z velocity, and the area that flow goes through is delta x delta y. These all get summed up and set equal to the rate of change of the cube mass from earlier. Notice that we've set the right-hand side to be negative. This is because if more flow were to leave the cube than enter, which is a positive on the left-hand side of the equation, and physical intuition tells us that the cube mass must go down in this situation. So, to preserve this physical intuition, the right-hand side must be set to negative. Let's take a second and put all the terms together into a single equation, and then move around the delta x, delta y, and delta z terms to simplify. Now, we seem to be getting closer to a final representation of our conservation of mass. In our analysis, we started with a cube with finite dimensions. To do calculus, what we do is shrink that cube down to be infinitesimally small, meaning we let delta go to zero.
In this case, what this means is that the uppercase deltas turn into lowercase deltas and represent a partial derivative. Write out our new equation with the fancy partial derivatives and you get what is officially the conservation of mass for a fluid in differential form. Nothing in fluid mechanics gets any one single name, otherwise that would be too easy. So sometimes you'll hear this referred to as continuity, and generally what they mean is conservation of mass. This equation holds true for any fluid situation. However, a very common assumption is that the fluid is incompressible that we talked about above. This means that we can't squeeze the fluid or change its volume for a given mass, which means we can't change its density. This assumption is primarily true for slow gases, meaning far from the speed of sound, and all liquids, so rarely do you come across situations where you can't use the incompressible assumption. If we say it is incompressible, that means the density is constant, so the density cannot change in time, setting that derivative to zero, and we can pull the density out of partial derivatives entirely. Applying this assumption to the above conservation of mass equation gives us the incompressible version of the fluid conservation of mass. You'll notice that the density is entirely gone. It can't change anyway, so it falls out. What we're left with is a balance of velocity spatial derivatives. These derivatives represent the mass in versus mass out in all three directions in x, y, and z. Sometimes, because the density is gone, it is hard to understand how the conservation of mass equation really only has velocity in it. Let's attempt to interpret the incompressible form of the equation a bit more physically. Let's draw our cube or box again, and this time we assume incompressible flow. We have streams of fluid flowing into and out of our cube. In a simple one-dimensional example, we cap the other sides and we find that Simply enough, what goes into the cube must come out. Otherwise, it would have to compress, and we don't allow that with our assumption. So, this means that there cannot be a change in velocity in or out of the cube. It must be constant, leaving du dx to be zero. Let's consider a two-dimensional example. Now, we cap the side to the cube in the original exit, and we only let flow out of the top of the cube via a flow in the y direction. We still have to follow the rule that what goes in must come out, but the x velocity inherently changes because it comes in in the x direction with a positive velocity, but it doesn't leave in the x direction. So we have a non-zero du dx. This must be inherently balanced by an equal and opposite dv dy, meaning that even though flow didn't enter the cube through the y side, it does exit through a y side, thus the y velocity changes in space. And lastly, we consider a third more complex scenario. We have flow in all three directions, and we cap the original x exit. Flow goes in through x, and some of it leaves through the y, and some of it leaves through the z. So again, we have a non-zero du dx, because flow is changing x velocity somewhere in our cube. The amount that leaves must balance that original du dx, meaning is equal to the sum of the change in velocity in the y and z directions. So dv dy and dw dz must compensate. In all of these cases, we consider changes in the velocity, not the velocity itself, which is why we look at derivatives of the velocity vector. Hopefully this helps add some physical intuition to the conservation of mass equation in the incompressible form. And that's it. Let's review. We started by defining the three properties of a fluid that must be conserved, the mass, momentum, and energy. And then we took a brief and intimidating glance at the conservation of mass and momentum equations in their entirety. Then, from a physical perspective, we slowly built the conservation of mass equation by considering an observation window in space and letting the fluid enter or exit our window. Building all three dimensions led us to the conservation of mass or continuity equation for a fluid. And finally, considering the incompressible version, which is arguably the most common, we tried to look at three examples to add some physical intuition to the equation.
I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.